on the cloud. Perfect. Um, so Nathan, I mean, I was just was reading your House of Beaufort book. So I want to bring that up so people can see it. It's a fantastic book. Um, and I love that there's more attention being given to the Beaufort family here recently, because there's also the book on Lady Margaret that's come out too. Or, um, so that's fantastic. So I'm excited to talk to you about the Beaufort family. Um, so I've got some questions and I am excited to just hear you talk too. So like to start with, what, well, wait, let me just pull. Okay, this is your book, House of Beaufort. So people should all get it and read it because it's fantastic. It's okay, there you go. <laughs> um, so what can you tell me about the, the Beaufort family? And, um, and it just, the, it's, such a, it's such an amazing love story, I guess, between, um, between Catherine Swinford and John of God. I mean, just, there's so much to them. How do we unpack it? Um, write a book and get people to read it. Right, right, okay. Um, Carol Ann. It's, it's quite an interesting story, as you say, um, but not one that's really been told much in, in the past. I mean, when we take the Beauforts themselves, uh, you know, as a strict dynasty, they were only around for 100 years, and they did a lot within that 100 years. Um, obviously, as you alluded to, they, they started through a, a, a love affair, you know, an extramarital affair between John of Gaunt and Catherine Swinford. Uh, John of Gaunt was probably one of the most powerful men in Europe at the time, uh, certainly the wealthiest man in England. Uh, you know, he was Duke of Lancaster, but he was also Earl of Lincoln, Earl of uh, Derby. Um, you know, he, he held vast... Um, swaths of land across all of England. Okay. Catherine Swinford was a governess in his royal nursery. You know, she she was just the daughter of a of a knight from the Low Countries. You know, they were certainly not what would have been considered the usual match for the time. I mean, Catherine, I mean, John John of Gaunt's first marriage was to a lady called Blanche of Lancaster, and she was the greatest heiress in England of her time. His marriage, who, a lady who was married to during his affair with Catherine Swinford, was Constance of Castile, and she herself was the daughter of, you know, a Spanish king. So these were the women that John of Gaunt was expected to be with, not his governess. But he, you know, he, he had an affair with her, uh, and during the 1370s, they had four children born out of wedlock, and they were John, Henry, Thomas, and Joan. Now, because they were illegitimate children, they couldn't be given their father's name, so to speak. So they couldn't be called, uh, you know, John Lancaster, for, for example. So they had to be given a different name. And the name that was chosen was Beaufort. Um, now, a lot of people think that the reason that they were given the name Beaufort is because they must have been born in France in one of John of Gaunt's French castles, but uh, you know, you know that's almost certainly nonsense. Um, Catherine Swinford was living in Lincolnshire throughout this time. She already had three children that she was raising. She was not going to France, you know, to give birth to kids. And not only that, the castle of Beaufort anyway was actually no longer in John of Gaunt's possession. He'd lost that castle to the French before they were even born. So I think it was just a very convenient name to give his children. So people knew they were his children. Um, yeah. You know, there was no claim to rival titles and so on. Uh, it's just a nice name really, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And so he, he recognized them right away as his own children. Um, was, there ever, uh, was there ever any question about that? He, he owned them right away? Yeah, I mean, there's no suggestion that they were kind of, um, you know, they weren't were his. Uh, he looked after them. He, he provided money to Catherine Swinford constantly during this period. I mean, she was known as his beloved dame in his own records. I mean, their love affair was a, a scandalous thing around court. Everybody knew about it. And during the Peasants' Revolt, it was one of the major issues against John of Gaunt that he had taken this 
you know, this low woman, and he was parading her on court. Uh, you know, it was unseen. Uh, and he pretty much had to publicly dump her at the time. But the children, he always provided for them. And it's just little things like uh, when, his, when his own legitimate heir, Henry of Bolingbroke, you know, was given certain, uh, you know, he was, he, he was named into the, the fraternity of Lincoln. Joining him at the time when they were children was his younger half-brother, John Beaufort. John of God was always pushing his bastard children and making sure they were closely aligned with the House of Lancaster, even as children. Um, and I think there's even a record in one of the chronicles where young John Beaufort was actually called John Beaufort of Lancaster. So mm. people who the both children were as young children. And so then he, he dumped Catherine Swinford after about a decade together after the peasants revolt. And then tell me what happened, how they, how they got back together then and how the, yeah, how did that happen? Yeah. I mean, in, in 1394, his second wife, Constance, died. Now, John of Gaunt was in his mid-50s by this point, you know, quite old for the time. He was wealthy. His ambitions had kind of started to dim by that point. Um, and he just simply took Catherine Swinford as his wife. Now, at the time, again, it was still expected he would have married for power or money. Because mm -hmm. he married Catherine Swinford the chroniclers were furious. Um, yeah. You know, one guy called Thomas Walsingham couldn't believe that he had married someone who had little fortune. Yeah. Um, I'm very hesitant to buy into a lot of this kind of, you know, oh, it was love stuff. Because um, everyone today wants a romantic story, you know, whether it's Catherine Swinford, Richard III, people want modern romanticism. That yeah. said, everything I've read about how Catherine Swinford and John of Gaunt, you know, how, the, how their, their relationship kept on. Mm -hmm. I think this is probably as close to a love match as we could, we could say for the time, for the time being. Um, but yeah, in, in two year, within two years after his second wife's death, he simply married Catherine Swinford. He married her in Lincoln Cathedral, which adds to my theory that the Beauforts were born and raised in and around Lincoln. And mm -hmm. that had always been based itself. And they, they, were, they were happily, well, you know, they, they were married without any scandal or any noticeable issue for the last couple of years of John of Gaunt's life. She seemed to be respected by John of Gaunt's legitimate heir, Henry of Bolingbroke. Mm -hmm. Henry became king himself after right. being the throne. She was referred to in the official records as the king's mother. You know, there was that element of respect given to her um, at the time. I mean, another thing that's actually quite interesting with Catherine Swinford was that when she was John of Gaunt's wife, um, the king at the time, Richard II, had, you know, his own wife had died. So she was technically the leading lady for a couple of years in the kingdom. Um, the Duchess of Lancaster, which probably would have made quite a few women at court at the time, you know, quite upset or envious. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was a remarkable rise for her to go from being just a governess. She, you know, she was a lowly, um, you know, she, lady of the manor in, in Lincolnshire. She was publicly, you know, dumped by John of God. So she wasn't even a mistress to be in the first lady of the land. Um, you know, it's, it's you can see why historical fiction loves Catherine Swinford. It's it's a brilliant story, to be fair. Yeah, no, it is. And um, what? Tell me about then how her children became legitimized um, and that agreement that they came to, and how? Yeah, tell me about that part. I mean, because John of Gaunt married Catherine Swinford. By the law of the church at the time, that made them legitimate. Oh, and right. I mean, John of Gaunt still ap appealed to the Pope himself to get clarification for this, and the Pope was happy to go ahead and do it. With, with, with civil law, 
it wasn't the case. You had to get the king to, and parliament to say you were legitimate. But John Gaunt again appealed to parliament and they legitimised the Beaufort. So that was 1397. So that's a year after their parents got married. Within a year, the Beauforts were declared legitimate by both the Pope and the Parliament. Now, why this was done, there's going to be two reasons. One, John of God only had one legitimate male heir at the time. He had daughters as well, but that, that, that heir, Henry of Bolingbroke, was in a very serious quarrel with the king of the time, Richard II. I mean, he eventually went on to usurp him, you know, a couple of years later. But there was the worry that something could happen to Henry of Bolingbroke. You know, he was actually exiled abroad for a bit instead of getting executed, as some people expected. So John of God needed an insurance policy. You know, if his eldest son is killed, who's going to take on all of his lands, all of his titles? Uh, you know, yes, they would by law pass to his legitimate daughters, but if you could legitimise his bastard offspring as well, then the Hancaster is emboldened. So there's that element. The second element is bastard children during the 14th and 15th century could not legally inherit anything. They had, couldn't get any of the states, any of the lands. They also could not, if they chose to go into the church, could not. You know, they were bastard offspring. So all avenues were blocked. So by making them legal, John was setting them up for, you know, future success. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, they were legitimised when the eldest Beaufort was about 22, 23 years old. And they, 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 were, they, they were starting to make a name for themselves, but it still is, you know, like John Beaufort was just a jouster. As soon as he legitimised, he became the Earl of... Um, the Earl of Somerset. The second son, Henry Beaufort, entered the church. He eventually became a bishop and then a cardinal. The youngest son, Thomas, became an earl and a duke. And then um, Joan Beaufort, the, young, the only daughter, you know, she'd already been married before she was legitimised. And she was married to just a, a, a local baron from Staffordshire. You know, it was, it was an average match. Her husband died the year she got legitimised. Her new husband was Ralph Neville of, you know, the Nevilles of, of Yorkshire. That was a, a much greater match for her. It was a greater match for him because now he was marrying a legitimised daughter of a duke, not just some bastard girl. So her own worth in the marriage market had gone, you know, high. So that's, the, you know, the, the legacy of them in the short term at least being legitimised, you know, they were suddenly somebody, they were now part of the royal family, you know, they were important people. But they were then told that they weren't going to be able to inherit the throne at all. Well, no. Okay. Um, <laughs> what history has always told us is that the Beauforts were barred from the throne, you know, it, it's a clear cut, they were legitimised but they were barred. Nobody's really studied the evidence too much because the Beauforts have never really been the, the leading characters. They've always been something people just, they're the Beauforts and they put them to the side. Obviously, with my book, I've decided to look closer at them. Now, they were legitimised by Parliament in 1397. And Parliament said they could inherit everything. You know, whether it's uh, baronies, earldoms, or, you know, becoming king. There was a lot of people ahead of them in, in you know, the line of succession. So, you know, nobody ever really meant that they were going to get the throne. But 10 years later, John Beaufort, the eldest Beaufort, asked to make sure that his, um, you know, his legitimization was all above board. And the reason he did that was at this time, the king had changed. So they were legitimized under Richard II, Within 10 years, their half-brother was now king, Henry IV. You know, it was common sense, just to make sure everything was fine. And it was granted. Now, fast forward a couple of hundred years later, we suddenly, or somebody suddenly, looked at the original parliament document, and on it was written three words, accepta dignitat regali, accept to the royal dignity. 
Mm -hmm. I see that just, you know, on the pages of a book. It seems very obvious. What it's saying is you can, you know, inherit everything except the royal dignity. And everything now says they were obviously barred from the throne. So I look into this a bit more. When you look at the original document, um, which I really wanted to put in my book, but it was too expensive to, um, to uh, include, uh, you know, the National Archives, they put a hefty fee on some of that stuff. Uh, but I show, it, I show it when I give public talks. And when you look at the original document, you know, this is the original document that went through Parliament. Parliament said, yes, this is perfect. On it, at some point in the future, we don't know when, the three words were scribbled onto the original document. Mm -hmm. New document, it was the original document, and it, looks, it almost looks like graffiti. Now, for that to actually be legal, you can scribble on the old document, but you still have to put it into Parliament, and Parliament has to say, we agree with this, this is now the law. That never happened. There's no evidence that this barren of the, of the Beauforts from the English throne ever took place. It never went into Parliament. The original act was never cancelled. So this idea that the Beauforts were barred from the throne has no, as far as the evidence shows at the moment, mm -hmm. legal basis. So I currently dispute the idea the Beauforts were barred from the, from the throne. I mean, you have to consider that when Henry Tudor tried to, you know, was threatening to come into England, all Richard III had to say was, look at this, he's barred from the throne, it says, yeah. yeah. He never did that. And I don't think anybody during the 15th century even knew that these three words had been scribbled onto the original parliamentary role, which then raises questions of, uh, you know, who did it, why did they do it, and even when it was done, because we know it was discovered, you know, in, I don't know when exactly, but 1700s, 1800s, when historians are going through the, through the rolls. No one's actually tested the writing. It could, it could be quite recent, right? Um, but I just look at, when you put things into a legal, a legal context, and when you, ask, when you ask the question of who at the time made anything about this, you know, it wasn't legal, and no one said anything about it. So maintain the Beauforts were always in line with the throne legally. But of course, you know, there was 50, 60 people ahead of them. So it doesn't really matter uh, much anyway, because might is right. So uh, as Henry Tudor proved, you know, the bottom line is who had the most power. Um, uh, you know, there we go, my bit. You mentioned in your book that Richard III had brought up the idea that John Beaufort was a product of adultery on both sides, too, yeah. and the rumor that perhaps Catherine Swinford had been committing adultery on her husband while he was away before he died. Um, but I'm just thinking about what you just said. If indeed they actually knew that this act had happened, surely he would have had something more to say than just, oh, yeah, both sides was adultery. Like, he would have been able to pull something out. Exactly. You know, he, he, now, the timeline, there is possibility for the timeline of John Beaufort to be uh, Catherine Swinford's child from her first marriage. I mean, I think her husband, Hugh Swinford, died some like eight months before he was born, you know, but... At the end, of all that matters is whether the father themselves recognise the son. Um, now, that obviously, yeah, that's what that's what Richard the Third zoned in on. Oh, Henry Tudor, his ancestors, you know, it was they were he was a bastard through his through his mother and his father's line. Mm -hmm. That's just speculation, and it's it's kind of like tawdry tabloid speculation. If he could have pulled out this parliamentary role, official legislative documents that say Henry Tudor had no right, that was surely the obvious thing. Now, what I've discovered is that these parliamentary roles, when they're written, they're just written on, you know, long sheets of paper, stitched, rolled up, and then chucked into storage. Now, you see many, you know, archivists today, there's so many documents in our archives 
that we've never ever unfilled. Um, you know, once they're written and they're chucked into storage, they can stay there for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm. Uh, somebody by luck almost pulls them out. I think current historians even say that we've got so much to the documents that have never been read because we simply don't have the time or the qualified people to read them. So this document, if it was written during the Beaufort's lifetime, then rolled up, then put in the story, yeah. it could be hundreds of years without anybody other than the person who wrote it looking at it, which is why Richard III never mentioned anything. You know, I just don't think anybody knew about this. Yeah. The 17, 1800s. And suddenly we've got this new historical fact created that the Beaufort's are bad and no one's ever really thought to question it. Uh, yeah, well, very interesting. Is that document, I'm just looking here on the National Archives site, is it is that publicly, I know you, you wanted to put it in your book, but you couldn't, is that something we can look up online and look at? No, no? You, you have to, yeah, I have to pay to even get somebody to take the picture of it. Wow. Uh, they went to, um, to quite an extreme. Yeah, I just see there's, there's a couple things here on online that you can download, but they're more recent. Yeah. So here's you know, some. I, 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 I keep, I keep, you know, like I, I do it in my talks. It's kind of the big reveal and yeah. given people, you can see their mind just go, oh, because when, you know, um, I would love to publish it online, but I think I'd kind of be given away, given yeah. away uh, the treasure. Yeah, um, yeah. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it's literally just, you know, it's a parliament role written as you think any document uh, mm -hmm. looks like, but in between the lines, it's just scribbled on. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it, graffiti is how I kind of, is the easiest way I can explain it. But if somebody had done that and then got parliament to say we agree with it, that, that you know, it's always like tipping her out and adding her in, but that never happens. So I think somebody with a grudge against the Beauforts I've done it, yeah, and then forgotten about it. You know, didn't do anything with it. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. So. so, tell me about what the Beauforts did. Then we fast forward a little bit to, um, well, like the next generation, and then during the Wars of the Roses, we've got one marrying into the Neville family, the daughter. But then, uh, tell me how that all kind of developed for them. Um, well, the daughter is the, the, the real interesting one that I've kind of recently taken to, to kind of start looking at because she's come up a lot in discussions such as this. You know, John Beauford, as I mentioned earlier, she married just a lowly baron when she was like 14. He died when she was 16, uh, 16 and 17, and she had two daughters by him. But then that year she got legitimised, so she was married off to, to Ralph Neville. Mm -hmm. Later her half-brother became the king. So within a couple of years, she'd gone from being a bastard daughter to being a legitimate duke's daughter to being the sister of the king. You know, that was some rise. And that worked for her husband, Ralph Neville, because suddenly he was the brother-in-law of the king. Before that, he was, you know, he, he, was, he, he was one of the two biggest lords in the north, but he was still just a baron. Mm -hmm. He got made an earl. Uh, and given a lot of land and a lot of castles in the north. Now, what's fascinating about Joan Buffett and Ralph Neville is Ralph Neville had eight children from his first marriage. You know, they were the legitimate Neville heirs. With Joan Neville, uh, Joan, well, yeah, Joan Neville, Joan Beaufort, um, he had another 14 children. Now, these children were descendants of the king. You know, Joan Beaufort was the granddaughter of Edward III. Ralph yeah. Nettles looked at his two children and gone, you know what? You're my first family, but you guys are descended from royalty. I'm going to make you my heirs. And what he did was him and Joan transferred all of the, the, the inheritance from this family to this family, to the Neville Beauforts. Mm -hmm. Disinheriting the legitimate Neville heirs. And that created a, a Neville civil war for decades in the North. But it worked, because when you consider that the grandchildren of Joan Beauford and Ralph Neville include Edward IV, Richard III, and Warwick the Kingmaker, you know, these are, these are the Yorkists, but they owed their power in the North to 
to their both foot grandmother. And that's something nobody ever considers. Um, I recently said, quite controversially, um, that Richard III actually owes his rise to the Beauforts. You know, everyone thinks of things very black and white. The Lancasters and the Beauforts, the Yorks. But I said, Richard's entire power and what a name was his northern power base. And that northern power base was created by the union between Joan Beaufort and Ralph Neville. She gave them royal power in the north. Uh, you know, Middleham, Sheriff Hutton, um, Raby, all these famous, you know, Richard III castles of the north, they were secured by Joan Beaufort. Um, you know, she would have been amazed to discover what would happen during the Wars of the Roses, because she died a decade before they started. But through her 14 children, through all the marriages they made through the kingdom, almost everybody in the Wars of the Roses was her descendant. You know, people call now the Wars of the Roses the Cousins' War, and they say that's because they were all descended from Edward III. They were all descended from Joan Beaufort, basically. You know, the vast majority of them, all of the great families of England, during the 15th century, you're talking the Staffords, um, the Percys, the Mowbrays, the Howards, the Yorks, they were all John Beaufort's descendants. You know, that, that's an astonishing legacy that, that she left that no one's really spent much time looking at. You know, it's, um, if there's any fiction writers out there, it's John Beaufort, I think, could be the next, the next big character. Um, definitely. And, you know, people always talk about Margaret Beaufort, you know, this strong, powerful matriarch. No, her great auntie, Joan Beaufort, that's, that that's, was a powerful, you know, and you're going back even further in history and she was definitely uh, bossing a lot of those powerful men around during her time. What was she like as a, as a person? What do we know about, like, very limited. Um, there was a she was determined because by disinheriting her husband's first family, she created enemies out of them. And after her husband died, the, ne the two Neville families went to war in the north and she stubbornly held out for her family. She was regularly called to court to answer for the crimes of, you know, creating war in the north. And she would back down, you know, she... she kept hold of her, what she saw as her right for her children uh, to a very end. You know, so, so she was definitely determined, uh, you could even say ruthless, I suppose, uh, you know, a great mother, uh, perhaps not so, you know, uh, great of as an enemy. Again, mm -hmm. what I would say of Margaret Beaufort, um, what I would actually consider any good mother to be like. I don't really understand why people criticise these women for looking out for their children's interests, you know. I, I, I'm happy my mother's like that, you know, I'd rather have a good mother um, to me. Um, but equally, we have also evidence of her that she perhaps, you know, had a tender side to her because th there was a story that, you know, during the you know, early 1400s, a couple had married without getting the, the appropriate approval. And they were banished from their villages and they fell, you know, into poverty. And they came to, to John Beaufort and appealed to her to help them. Well, she was the sister of the king. So she wrote to the king, uh, you know, this long, loving and tender letter to him, you know, my, my brother, I really hope you're well, because he was ill at the time. You know, th there was a good relationship between sister and brother, and she appealed to him to help out this couple, you know, to help and to stop his men from punishing them. Now, I don't know what the outcome was, but the fact that she even bothered to write to the king, you know, about what was such a minor nothing issue, it obviously did something to her heart to do that. So I think, you know, of that one evidence alone, we can perhaps... Uh, speculate that she was quite a, a decent person. Um, the difficulty I have with history is what I always say is with such little evidence, 
it's as if I've been on Facebook for, you know, 10 years and all that somebody of the future has got is one day's worth of posts to try mm -hmm. and build up an image of who I am. You know, I could have been in a right mood on that day. I could have been, you know, joking, laughing. So I always use that as an analogy that's quite difficult to when we've got such little um, to build on, but yeah. you can only make the best guesses you can based on what you have. So I think ruthless, determined, also kind, loving, you know, not, not one dimensional, you know, sure. different days, different person. Sure, sure, of course. Um, and so then just walk me through what happened to John's family, because that's then uh, what, what was going on with it, them during the Wars of the Roses and um, yeah. on it. Yeah. Well, John was the eldest Beaufort and John died in 1410. He died quite early. Um, and his position as the, you know, as the non-churchman head of the family was taken over by his younger brother, Thomas. Now, Thomas also died in 1427 without children. So the mantle was taken on in the next generation by John's children. And one of them was Edmund Beaufort. You know, the, of Beaufort, the, the Beaufort males had a tendency to die out without children. Um, you know, they did that throughout the century. Edmund Beaufort, so of the second generation, John's son, he rose to power during the 1430s and 1440s. And he was given quite a lot, you know, he was close to the king, in, but then Henry VI in lineage. No, they were second cousins. So he got a lot of opportunities, you know, a lot of titles, a lot of chances to go abroad and fight in France. And by getting all that opportunity, he, you know, we call it nepotism, really. He was, uh, he made an enemy of the Duke of York. So Duke of York was another, you know, descendant of the king. Greater in royal descent, but still further away from the current king. Mm -hmm. it, you know, because John and Edmund were locked at the Lancaster to close that. So he was yeah. here. And, you know, it, it, just, it was just a natural, you know, the town isn't big enough for the both of them situation. Only one man can be the king's right-hand man. And I often say the Wars of the Roses was not a fight between York and Lancaster. It was always a fight between Beaufort and York. Always was from day one to the very end. You know, even if you consider Richard III, the York heir, and Henry II to the Beaufort heir. You know, it always was. And it, it just was a personal blood feud between Edmund Beaufort and Duke of York over who had who had the number two position, you know, to very simplify matters. And Henry VI, being a weak king, just couldn't contain that. Right. And the very, very first part of the Wars of the Roses in 1455, you know, depending if you're a modern-day Yorkist or, or, or Lancastrian, you know, from my understanding, from my reading of it, it was quite simply an assassination. You know, it was a mob hit. That's, that's where it was. It was the Yorkists zoning in on Edmund Beaufort in, in 1455 and just taking him out. It wasn't a battle. They attacked him in the streets and killed him. Probably you then created enemies of Edmund's children who were then, you know, 18, 18 19 years old. They then created, uh, you know, they have to kill the Yorks no matter what. Mm -hmm. Edmund's eldest son, Henry, killed the Duke of York six years later, five years later, at the Battle of Wakefield. So he's got his revenge. He's killed his father's killer. The problem there now is the Duke of York has his own children, Edward IV, Richard III. They now go after the Beauforts, and they wipe them out at two in 1471. You know, that's how we end up with just Margaret Beaufort standing alone. You know, it just was a zigzag of killing your enemies. Mm -hmm. um, all because of people wanted that number two spot. Now, depending on who you speak to, what your modern vantage point is, York should have had the power. Well, I want power now. It doesn't mean I, I necessarily get power. You know, what we get politicians in power in the modern day. Should they have that power? Maybe, maybe not. Just because this guy over here wants the power doesn't mean he can just have the power. You know, it might, it might make sense. 
it might be what the people want mm -hmm. uh you know that, that's just how the world works you can't resort to to warfare um i i personally think the, the duke of york it was yeah he might have been the best man for the job but it's not his decision to make that yeah yeah they didn't want you so you, you know you can't just go around killing because you've opened a proper can of worms there that you know, lasted into the reign of Henry VIII, really. So, right, right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, that's a very simplified reading, pretty much. You know, the, the Beaufort's place in history seems to be as the antagonists of the House of York. Mm. So interesting. And I, I had one other question about M Margaret Beaufort. And there were like three Margaret Beauforts. What, there were several Margaret Beauforts, weren't there? Yeah. And they were all pretty, like, all of these Beaufort women were pretty strong, weren't they? Yeah, and my, my favourite historical fact is that um, Margaret Beaufort, the famous enemy of Richard III, you know, with a son called Henry. Well, the other Margaret Beaufort uh, was, I think, the Countess of um, Buckingham or Countess of Stafford. She had a son called Henry, and that was Henry, the Duke of Buckingham, who rebelled against Richard III in 1483. So there were, in fact, two Margaret Beauforts, both with sons called Henry, both who rebelled against Richard III. And I think that's a fascinating little... Amazing. You know, tidbit that no one ever really picked up on. Yeah. No, and it was funny because I was reading something in your book and you said um, Margaret by this point had been, had spent most of her life away from her son and was something anxious. To, and I was like, wait, what generation am I on? I was flipping through because it, it just sounded like, like the other one. And this was the first one. And I was just for a minute, I had this weird deja vu, like what? And uh, yeah, it's yeah. very difficult to write. I mean, when they, a family case, when there's so many Thomas's, John's, and you know, people, you know, some people will say, oh, I lost track. And yeah. right this point of view, it's, it's next to impossible. To, you, you can either keep on naming them, you know, John Beaufort, John Beaufort, John Beaufort, or you can start to call them by the title, Somerset, Somerset, Somerset. But of course, that title will eventually change. <laughs> you know, it's just so writing a family book over 100 years with multiple Somersets, multiple Edmund Beauforts, Thomas Beauforts, it's... It's hard, it's hard for me doing the writing, so. You have to have like little posters and post-it notes up around you, which ones? <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I, that was kind of my, my main questions. Um, I'm just gonna unmute, there's only, it's a small group here. If you guys wanna jump in and ask any questions, um, please feel free as well. Um, hi, Tina. I didn't get to say hi to you when you first. Hi. <laughs> hi. Um, so, so I had a question. Um, why do you suppose the women of this time, you talked about Joan and we know about Margaret, were so extraordinary? I mean, you know, you look at Cecily Neville as well. I mean, I think yeah. there are just these extraordinary women during this time who don't get always a lot of play. So I'm really glad to see them getting some play now. But in a very patriarchal male dominated society, I'm just quite interested in the women taking such a strong role and being so strong. Just wondered what your thoughts were on that. I mean, you know, the other person we haven't mentioned was a different Joan Beauford, who was mm -hmm. the Scotland. You know, of all of yeah. that, she was perhaps even more remarkable in that, you know, she, she was there when her husband, I think James the I think, uh, got murdered. She apparently got stabbed, you know, because whatever was happening in England, the Scots always <laughs> did it, you know, to the extreme. Uh, you know, so she was there when her husband got stabbed, or she got murdered. She got stabbed and she escaped with her son, who was, you know, one or two years old. And then she swore vengeance on the enemies, got them captured, and then got them killed. All the people who killed her husband, you know, talk about ruthless. She <laughs> brought him. She took her revenge and killed her husband's enemies. Um, so, you know, so you're right. That, that, that's four Beaufort descended women there. Mm -hmm. Maybe something still Catherine Swinford. I mean, Catherine Swinford was remarkable herself. You know, John of God was obviously, you know, quite a character. Maybe it's just in the blood, you know. It's, yeah. um, it, maybe it's perhaps 
the, four, the 1400s, the, the reason I like the 1400s is we start to get some real good evidence, you know, chronicle accounts, uh, you know, it's a start of people really writing history of the time. And perhaps they, there's just enough, a little bit of, you know, drama about these people's lives, but enough that we don't know that we in our minds are creating images of who they were. You know, perhaps we're way off off the money. You know, perhaps we just want them to be these remarkable women. <laughs> um, and same for the men, you know, and we're kind of creating creating heroes in our mind um, when it may not necessarily be the case. Um, it's like when I moved forward to the to the 1500s, the 1600s, it actually gets too much, um, too much uh, sources and research for me. You know, I start to get lost in it all. Um, I don't know how people research modern history, like what the world, world wars and, uh, you know, the 20th century, because there must just be source overload. So perhaps there's that element that we just don't know enough about them, but we know a little bit and our minds run away with us. Um, I, I don't know the answer, to be honest. It's, you know, again, maybe it's just Catherine Swinford set such a, a unique kind of example that her daughters and granddaughters just took the family mantle. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions? Yeah, I think it's interesting, the women in this period, because it, if any woman who has 14 children, I'm sorry, but there's something <laughs> remarkable about that right there. Like, if you have 14 children, I, anything else you do after yeah. that, Tales in comparison. But oh, six, 16, really, because she had two children from the first marriage. God bless her. God bless her. Yeah. And she's still, lit. how old was she when she died? Uh, 14, 40. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And, and the, 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 the great thing is that just how every, you know, I, I would only recommend going to Wikipedia look at her children and just see what became of all of them. You know, it's remarkable. All of her daughters were countesses, you know, and duchesses. Her sons and grandsons were all, well, some were kings, but generally they were earls. Uh, they were bishops. There were quite a few bishops in there. You, you know, her, that, her, that Neville brood that she birthed, they didn't have to take on, you know, even the women. People always, people always just look at, the Beauforts are in the male line, the Yorks in the male line. And people forget, just your name, is, is, your surname is this. Doesn't mean that you aren't part of that family, if you know what I mean. Uh, like, no one would consider the, the, the Percys or the Staffords or the Mowbrays to be Beauforts because their name is Stafford, Percy or Mowbray. But their grandmother was John Beaufort. You know, they would have been related and so entwined with the Beaufort family, even if they faced off on opposite sides in battles. Uh, mm. It happened at the Battle of um, Battle of Northampton, where two of John Beaufort's daughters had sons on opposing sides. You know, uh, you know, you, you can imagine if it was modern day, if they had WhatsApp or, or Facebook. <laughs> or, you know, what's your son doing? But, uh, you know, the conversation must have taken place somehow at some point between such close family members, you know. The family WhatsApp group chat on that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a little bit awkward. <laughs> Duke of York leaves chat and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Cool. Um, anything else pop up? If not, I will just um, thank you. I'm trying to look for my iPad again to show your book. Well, you have your book. So, plug your book. Your, so there you go. You have the book too. <laughs> I will show you. There is this page just waiting for me to meet and get your autograph. So I'm waiting. One day. One day. Right here. <laughs> He's coming to TutorCon. We're all keeping I know. Up. And you know, yeah. I am counting on TutorCon. So. <laughs> Definitely there. Yeah. 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 So we'll get to meet you there. Yeah, perfect. Plug plug your stuff here now. Tell tell us your website and your books and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the website is nathanamin.com, but you're probably better off just going to my Facebook off the page. I'm quite active there. 
um, my next book is going going to be Henry the Seventh and the Two the Pretenders. So if anything, it's continuing the Wars of the Roses into Henry the Seventh's reign and just seeing how did he mop up the the issue that should have been out in July, but obviously I think we're getting knocked back. Everything's getting knocked back at the moment. So at the moment that's November. Okay. Uh, which works f- perfect for me, really. So I'm not I'm too much of a worry about it. You know, I just try and create a bit more urgency amongst my readers so that when it does finally come out, people want it. Um, but yeah, and hopefully that will be... I, mean, I, th- I think it's quite a good book. I think it's full of, you know, scandal, conspiracy, plots, battles. You know, it, I think it's a quick-paced book. Um so yes, I, I think people will enjoy that. And it's also, again, something like the Beaufort book no one's ever really considered. Um, when we talk about the princes in the tower, when we talk about Perkin Warbeck or Lambert Simno, it's always from the kind of the York side of, of the matter where they must have been the princes of the tower and, you know, and it's their story. But hang on, what was Henry the Tudor's archer play in this? What was his worry? What were, what were his fears? You know, history isn't either or this which is what I've shown in the Beaufort book you know history they always say history is written by the victors and it is and I've always taken it as a slur against the Tudors but hang on a minute the Beauforts were destroyed by the Yorkist victors you know for 30 years the Yorkists had the grip on the story and they destroyed the Beaufort story they destroyed Edmund Beaufort's reputation uh, and they made them less than known people in history um, and obviously when Henry Tudor did come along it didn't really play in his part to go back and revisit things it's all about I'm here now and I'm going to bring and move on so the, the Beaufort story remained untold you know maligned and so on so I'm going to try and you know do the same with the, the Henry the Seventh book really with um what happened because even forgetting about the kind of I don't I don't really like mystery history I thought you know were, were the prince in the tower who did it you know Jack the Ripper who did it it doesn't really interest me because we don't know the answer it's kind of there's nothing more frustrating than doing what ifs so I look at exactly what happened and that alone is fascinating like I said it's the amount of plots that took place during Henry the Seventh's reign you know, people will now say, oh, he's the paranoid king. People try to kill him every day. Of course he's the paranoid, you know. He doesn't know if he's going to walk down for breakfast in the morning and his chamberlain is going to kill him. You know, he, he, his head was must have been all over the place, even more so after, you know, his wife and his son die and he's got session to think about. If anything, it's credit to him. He didn't go completely loopy like his son did, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um but then hopefully I kind of get get that point across really, but we'll see. Yeah. I love that quote. That's fantastic. It's a credit he didn't go completely loopy. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Nathan, for being no here. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and um, put this up on my page and everything like that. And hopefully um, people, yeah, just thanks for coming by and having this time for us to get together and no bring some tutor to our lockdown time. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye.